Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. The first story. A farm applying for an EU agricultural subsidy delivers 831 pages long document printed, as per local bureaucrats exact request. The second story. My company charged me for insurance, but never paid the insurance company. The third story. Stupid guy got himself into trouble because he didn't listen to us. Today's first story is... Document hoarding bureaucrat gets exactly what they asked for. Not my story, but from a farm boss I used to work with. Little House on the EU. A small farm in European Union was applying for an EU agricultural subsidy for a storehouse. Big enough for storing a couple of farming vehicles and odd bits of this and that, and otherwise lying around the farm like orphan rounds of cheese. Nothing fancy. EU is notorious for the exhausting amount of paperwork needed for any kind of agricultural subsidy. The process is usually both long and tedious. Ask any farmer if you don't take my word. On top of that, you have the local government adding their mostly unnecessary and confusing bureaucratic sprinkles to the cake. Because who just doesn't love good old paperwork? Yay! Does it really exist? The building already there and in use. Farm Boss has been engaged with the subsidy application process since the beginning of the project over two years ago. Literally hundreds of emails, calls, and letters have been exchanged between various instances. Application process is like this, nothing abnormal about that. A bureaucrat had to be convinced that a building has been built, and it's for the intended purpose. Note, a building permit, a proof of a bank loan, the building inspector's report and photographs of the actual building were not enough evidence. Apparently a storehouse doesn't stand on its concrete foundation, housing farming equipment and material, before a bureaucrat acknowledges the matter. An existential crisis of architectural sorts, I suppose. Finally, after much struggle and convincing, a bureaucrat acknowledged officially that a storehouse has been built, and it's used for its intended purpose. We. Aforementioned part of the bureaucracy is not essentially part of the MC story itself, nor was it the only one. But before proceeding, I wanted to give you, dear reader, a palpable example of a mucus oozing snail. That is, a bureaucrat. Was it really paid for? Now another bureaucrat wants to know all the costs claimed in the subsidy. Application have been actually paid. Makes sense, you don't want to assist scammers who forge fake invoices and payments. In this project, there were some 150, give or take, financial transactions involved for material, labor, insurance permits, etc. Want all the invoices? You got it. Want all the receipts? Okie dokie. Want the bookkeeping statements? If you say so. This last one has special significance. Bookkeeping statements contain a legally binding track of every single invoice and payment. Bookkeepers swear on the blood of their firstborn baby it's correct. Even the tax office is happy with that, and they're not easy folk to please. But the local government sitting on top of the EU money, which isn't even their money, no, not enough for them. They want to be super duper extra hyper sure how every single last nut, bolt, and screw is paid for. Because maybe farm boss is just a scammer who likes to spend two years on paperwork. Regardless the fact that the little storehouse stands proud and stout in a farm, which has existed for decades in the exact same location. Enter Smaug's Lair. Like a dragon hoarding gold and treasure to sleep upon, a bureaucrat hoards information and documents, apparently to sleep upon too. Local government bureaucrat wants to be able to track every single financial transaction. Not by invoice number. Not by invoice date. Not by invoice sum. Not by combination of these. No, they want the project references. Not sure about the exact translation of this, combined with the actual payments. It's a 10-digit code attached to each part of the storehouse building project. For example, the roof has its own code under which all parts, labor, etc. go. After some hassle with the accountant agency and the banks, such list was materialized. It took only two weeks, so it was a quickie compared to the whole process. It was an impressive 831 pages long PDF. So big because of dozens of payments, small and big, far and near, accumulated over the time span of two years. Every single financial transaction. The information needed for the subsidy application is spanned through the document, maybe some 50 odd pages. Just deliver the 50 odd pages easy peasy? Bureaucrat says no. Obviously one can't omit the unrelated pages, because bureaucrat wants to observe the document both consistent and continuous. In other words, if the total page count is 831, that's how many pages there has to be. End of discussion. Happy bunny now? Okay, you'll get the whole document. Happy now, bureaucrat? No, all the information is there. How come? Nope, we bureaucrats want to find the information easily. 
but we have already provided the cross-reference list with all project references and invoice numbers. How's that? No can do. We bureaucrats want easy. How about pressing Control F, search? That's easy as one, two, three? Nope, we bureaucrats want to have project reference highlighted. On paper, because that's easy. But it'd be a ton of paper. Wouldn't it surely be easier to use the electronic format? Sensible arguments overwhelmed by angry bureaucratic noises. No, 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 absolutely not. Highlighted on paper, easy. Now you dear reader already know what time it is. It's MC o'clock. Farm boss goes through the PDF with control F and uses the marker tool to highlight the project references with the pretty yellow. One day's work, then sit back and print. Numerous coffees and one color cartridge later, there's a nice pile of A4 sheets. 4.2 kilograms, 9.3 pounds to be exact. Neatly stacked and boxed, sent as a registered letter. Also a bureaucratic requirement, to the bureaucrat in need of an easy documentation. Have fun browsing through papers searching for the project references one by one all by hand. Aftermath. For farm boss, this was just another day in the never-ending bureaucratic jungle. Exhausting and stressful. If you think being a farmer is easy, you apparently don't know any farmers. I take my hat off for them any day of the week. What comes to this particular bureaucrat in question? Well, they never ask for a single document more. It really is a very silly request, especially in the digital 21st century. I'm convinced that this is how the government is trying to save money. To make the process so ungodly difficult, long and tedious, that ordinary people just give up. Applies to various subsidies, unemployment insurance benefits, and many other government services. I had a boss who wanted all documents, important and not important, printed out. I tried many times to explain to him that some documents could be sent digitally. I also showed him how it worked, but he was so stubborn that he refused. Then my boss's boss said that a lot of money was spent on printers, paper, printer ink, etc. And he told me to send the documents digitally. The boss agreed because he had no choice. And I had suggested this option from the beginning. And if he had listened to me, maybe he wouldn't have been reprimanded by his boss. The second story is, Come right back to the office. Don't mind if I do. I was working at yet another soulless call center. Through years of bad ideas, alcohol, and generally getting punched in the face, I had a broken tooth that was no longer serviceable. I could no longer adhere that over-the-counter tooth cement to it, let it dry and pretend I didn't notice it. It hurt. My face was swollen. I'm pretty sure my breath was fetid. I was trying to move from slacker to adult, so I made an appointment to get it pulled. I was salary. Regularly worked weird schedules, but still gave heads up to the brand new shiny director and HR goon, and my supervisor that I was going in for an emergency tooth removal, and would be gone for part of the day. My boss? No worries or concerns. He knew I would come in for whatever whenever. The new director? Not so much. She didn't like me because somebody told her I wasn't nice, or some other nonsense. You can go on your lunch to do whatever you want, but come right back to the office. That wasn't going to happen. She wasn't in my chain of command, and I only told her out of a courtesy. My boss knew I was out. She could be mad. This all changed while I sat in that not too comfy chair, already stabbed in the gums a half dozen times to numb up. The nice front counter lady came in to tell me I didn't have dental insurance. I laughed, explained of course I did, and validated all my information. She asked to speak to me alone. Apparently my company had charged me for my insurance, but never paid the insurance company. Even better, the company had done this for every employee on this plan, for a while. F it. I have the cash, pay for the procedure right then. A little over an hour later, a small bit of beard missing from clamps catching in it, stitches in my gums they had to cut, tooth gone, I'm ready to go back to work and ask some questions. After all, they wanted me to come back, right? I don't even clean up. Blood down my swollen face. Blood on my shirt. A little bruising on my face from an oh crap moment when part of the tooth broke more while extracting. I walk right into the night HR person's office and hand him my receipt. I explain what happened. He calls the director in and starts making calls. Her. Why are you here looking like that? Go clean up. Me. You said come right back. Her. You're a health hazard. Me. If I only had dental insurance, huh? Her. Of course we have insurance. Why would you walk in here like that? Me. You said come right back. This circular exchange lasted about 10 minutes. HR dude needed me to make copies of the receipts. I walked to the furthest possible printer, making sure enough people saw me. They asked what was up. I told everyone what was going on with the insurance. Emails started. Calls started. People were very unimpressed. Get back to the HR office. He's ready to make sure I get reimbursed on the next check. Back pay for the insurance I've paid that I didn't have insurance for. Him. Okay, we'll go ahead and head out. You can use my door out. Don't tell anyone about what's going on. Me. Too late. I've told at least 10 people. Director. Why would you do that? 
Me, well, you did tell me to come right back. We all got reimbursed, and company put out a big apology memo, bought pizza, because that's what call centers do, and HR guy did a lot of butt kissing. I don't understand why they haven't found the person responsible for this. The fact that HR guy has not been fired is staggering to me. It explains why SH people and charlatans do what they do, because they get away with it. Good thing they gave you and the rest of the employees their money back, but it shouldn't be like that. It's crazy to me that companies can get away with this crap. You should have sued them for breach of contract. I hope you were pursuing this. Whatever your local laws are, I'm sure one of them was broken. But if you don't want to sue, I would recommend reporting them to your local labor department. Everyone understands that they don't want you to tell people. At best, it will let them deal with it and quietly sweep it under the rug. At worst, it will give them time to get rid of you. The fact that they told you not to tell anyone makes the situation worse and shows that it wasn't an effing mistake. The last story is... You want me to shut up and follow your directions? Okie dokie. This happened around the early 2000s when I was working for my uncle's fencing company. So customer, a-hole, purchased a newly constructed home. Cookie cutter, everything builder grade. The land plots were divided only by fluorescent, orange, marking spray paint, hardly official. My uncle submitted a bid per customer A's request and we got the project. We had the lowest bid, around $1,200 lower than the completion. The caveat? We collect full payment up front. Not a deal breaker for customers, as we accept credit card payments. This way both parties are protected from fraud. During that time, my uncle had just left his previous job as a land surveyor. His specialty? Property line surveying. The estimated property line, marked by the above mentioned orange spray paint, was nearly two feet off on one side of customer A's property. My uncle makes the necessary adjustments and markings and we start digging the post holes. Customer A makes a surprise job site visit and inspection. He sees our post holes and turns beet red. He rushes towards us and starts dropping F-bombs left and right. What the F are you idiots doing? You're giving away part of my property to my effing neighbor. Can't you effers effing see the bright orange marking on the effing dirt? I want you geniuses to fill up these holes ASAP and dig right where the orange lines are. I want my fence directly on top of the orange lines. I just about lost it and was about to get in customer A's face. My uncle stops me and he tries to explain. The orange lines are off. Customer A. I'm the one paying here, not you. So you follow my effing directions. Uncle. Please let me explain. Customer A. No, no, no. I've paid you in full. You're not paid to explain. You're paid to build my fence exactly the way I want it, where I want it. This effing conversation is over. He drives off and my uncle looks at me with a malicious smile. OP, let's grab an early lunch and then we'll give him what he wants. I shrug. Over lunch he calls my aunt, his secretary, to have her draft a new JOC slash work order contract. In it, it's explicitly and officially noted that the fence will be erected 22 inches east of the official property line and that the customer will shoulder full responsibility and liability. Should a conflict arise, either with their future new neighbor, the home next door was still unsold at that point, or any other party, Aunt emails the contract to customer A. My uncle and I have our two martini lunch hour. Aunt calls and says customer A has signed and emailed the new contract back to her. And now that we have a paper trail, we go back to the site and continue working. The same afternoon, customer A pays us another visit and says, just checking to see if you decided to follow my instructions. You idiots didn't wait for me to sign the new contract before resuming work, did you? Me, we sure did. As he turned around to leave, I can hear him mouth something of, effing idiots. Upon completion, three days later, he signs off that the work was satisfactory. He was still in a-hole mode, refusing to acknowledge either my uncle or I when we thanked him for his business. Four months later, he contacts my uncle again, requesting for him to bid on a new project. Yep, you guessed it, to move the existing fence on top of the official property line. We gave him an unreasonably high bid and still secured the project. This time around, he was a teddy bear throughout the entire project. Ha <laughs> ha, well, he got what he wanted, so he should have listened to you right away and not made such a stupid mistake. I'm glad you let him sign the contract and absolved him of all responsibility, because he could have blamed you. People who do the work are human and can make mistakes like anyone else. But if you refuse to listen to the people you pay to do something, then whatever happens is on you. Subscribe, hit the like button, and have a great day.